Esther chapter 6 have entitled the message today, Divine Restlessness. Divine Restlessness. And uh, we're going to read the whole chapter. It's only 14 verses. So I'm going to read them actually. And you'll follow along beginning in verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep. And he commanded to bring uh, the book of records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. You know what happened there? The king couldn't sleep. The book of the chronicles, you know what those were? They were history books. So he basically said, hey, go get me some history books and read to me. I know that will put me to sleep. And it was found written that Mordecai, so his attendants there were reading him very recent history. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, uh, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. And, uh, and, and, and the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Here's what happened. They were reading just by chance, by chance, I think, I suspicion God had a lot to do with this, and we'll talk about that. They were reading, and they told of a man named Mordecai. And as they were reading, they, were, they, they read about the plot to murder the king. That's what this was. And this plot is uh, described, not in great detail, but in chapter 2, and we'll take a look at that. But the plot to murder the king, Mordecai found out about it. He told Esther, Esther told the king, these men were found and were tried and were hung. So you could say that Mordecai saved the king's life. So as they read that to him when he couldn't sleep that night, he said, wait a minute. I don't remember ever doing anything for Mordecai. And the attendants said, well, that's because you didn't ever did anything. And he said, well, we need to fix that. So, verse 4, and the king said, who was in the court? Now Haman was coming to the, only God can do this stuff, folks. Read it, read it here. Now Haman was coming to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang who? Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. Remember last week we talked about how that, how that uh, 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 Haman said, I got all of this wealth, I have all of this power, I have all this position, and I have a great family, and, and I have all of these blessings, but it all counts as nothing because one man will not bow down to me. We preached on that last week. So Haman's the man, and Haman got all discouraged and angry and ugly about it and didn't know what to do. His wife and his friends said, you ought to hang him. Haman, you should hang Mordecai. Make an example out of him. And uh, you should build some gallows that are 50 cubits high, which is 75 feet, so that everybody, no matter where they're at, could see Mordecai getting hanged. And Haman said, great idea. Boy, how things turn. So the king says, I want somebody to help me plan a big day for Mordecai. Who's, you know, who's one of my guys? Who's hanging around out there in the court? And they said, Haman. Haman's out there. Have Haman come in. Keep in mind, Haman was there to see the king about hanging Mordecai. That's why he was there. And, and the king couldn't sleep the night before, had the history books read, and the history books said, Mordecai is a hero. He saved your life. And King Ahasuerus says, we got to do something for him. Who's out there that can help me plan this big day? Haman's out there. Have him come in. Haman's a good man. He's a trusted man. He can, he can help me do something really special for Mordecai. Only God can do this stuff, folks. Um, let's see, verse 6. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than myself, more than me? He's talking about me. He wants to honor me. So Haman, hey, well, king, this is what I think you should do. 
Haman answered the king, verse 7, for the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king uh, useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand, uh, uh, to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. I get the chills over this stuff. Haman hates Mordecai, and he hates the, Jew, the Jewish people, right? Remember, we, we talked several weeks ago about why he hated the Jews. That goes back hundreds of years before. And he hated Mordecai, and he's going to kill him. He's already tricked the king, convinced the king to exterminate uh, through genocide the Jewish people. That's going to happen in about a year. And he says, but I want Haman's blood now. I want his blood right now. I want him dead now. And he says, I'm going to go to the king. And the very day that he goes to the king to talk to the king, the king says, hey, Haman, I'm glad you're here, buddy. I got a guy I want to honor. You do. Yes, I want to do great things. I want to honor him greatly. And Haman, in his heart, says, he's talking about me. He wants to honor me. He's just not letting the cat out of the bag yet. What do you think we should do? I think that the man, you should let him wear uh, uh, the very garments that you wear, your robe, and dress him up like you would and ride your horse, and we'll parade him through the streets, and we'll honor him, and, we'll, and, and everybody will look to him, and he will be king for a day, if you will. Great idea. I, hey, King Ahasuerus, I knew, Haman, I knew I could count on you. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I could count on you to come up with a good idea. Yeah, that's me, King. I'm the originator of all good ideas. Verse 10, and I know you know what's coming. Then the king said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse, as thou hast said, Yes, 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 and, and do even so to Haman, Mordecai, his enemy, the one that he was there that day to ask for permission to hang on the gallows. Ahasuerus says, That's who we're going to honor today to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken he said now listen listen Haman this is a great thing this guy saved my life and somehow it just it, it I don't know but it passed and I never did anything for him and we're going to take care of him now look everything you said I don't want one thing to left to let go undone. I want you to do everything and maybe even more. Make this a huge, huge event and honor this man for saving my life. And Mordecai came again uh, to the king's gate, verse 12, but Haman hasted to his house mourning. <laughs> of course he did. Haman ran home, and when it was in well, mourning, incredible discouragement, like, unbelievable. look, just totally outside of his mind, how could this have happened? How could this, everything was going along so well. And now, it is my job to honor the very man that I wanted to hang. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends everything that had befallen him. Verse 13, then said his wise men, and Zeresh, his wife, unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. There was a banquet yet that Esther had prepared for Haman and the king. We'll get into that next week. But here's the point today. Divine restlessness. You say, 
Why couldn't the king sleep that night? Look, I don't know. You know what? Actually, I'm going to back up. I think I do know. It's not said here in the scripture, but uh, I was talking to my Sunday school class today a little bit about this. Gave them a little bit of a preview of the sermon. Why couldn't the king sleep? Maybe he ate something. Maybe he had an upset stomach. Maybe there was a problem uh, in the kingdom. It's stress, causing him a stressful time. And maybe he laid awake at night, couldn't go to sleep. Look, maybe he had a fight with one of his wives. Not that that's ever happened to anybody. But whatever reason, he could not sleep. And look, there are commentators, people that are, 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 are far smarter than we are, far smarter than we, that speculate on the reason why maybe he could, could, he could not sleep. You know what I say? I say he couldn't sleep because of all the praying that was going up to heaven by the Jews. When that law came out that, they, that everybody that was a Jew was going to be exterminated in a year from now, Throughout the entire kingdom, the Jewish people began to fast and began to pray to God that something would happen and that, and that and, uh, God, would call, God would deliver them. Not only that, when Mordecai came to Esther and said, Esther, you are the number one wife of the king. You have been put in that position to go to him for this very purpose, to deliver the Jews... Esther herself said, I'd like for everybody around me and Mordecai you and everybody you know, I'd like for us to uh, fervently pray and fast for three days. And then this happens. You know why King Ahasuerus couldn't sleep that night? Because God said, you're going to stay awake, big boy. I got something to show you. And the thing I have to show you is going to set in motion it's going, to be, it's going to be the very beginnings of what will end in the deliverance of the Jewish people. And not only Mordecai. At the time, King Ahasuerus did not know that Haman was going to hang Mordecai. Only God can do this. Do you think that the people that prayed to God, the Jews that were praying, that's why he couldn't sleep, because God was answering the prayers of the Jews, and, and, and who knows what their idea was to, for deliverance uh, from the law that was set to kill them. But I'll guarantee you this, no Jew prayed this prayer. God, I want you to have the king not be able to sleep one night. And then uh, the next step of my prayer is he'll ask uh, his, his attendants to go get some history books, to bring them in, and then in those history books, uh, God, I pray that they'll choose the right one, and uh, it'll be about the story of how Mordecai uh, saved the king's life, and, and then, Lord, I want you to, you know, the next thing, the next step in the, in the prayer, the plan is, look, nobody prayed that prayer. God says, my ways Look, they said, deliver us, king. And look, and they probably had things in mind that he might could do to deliver them. Just like you and I often have certain ways that we help God with a plan to deliver us from the suffering that we are in. And we'll have, look, you've never done this. I know that. Let me tell you what I've done. I've said, God... I, I got a problem, and it needs to be handled. Now, look, you can do this. That would solve it. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine, because I got, I got a lot of ideas. You can do this one, and uh, that'll solve it. And, and if those two don't work for you, here's another one. Here's another. I got four ways, God. I've got it all figured out. I can't do it. I need you to do it. But, and you know what God says? I don't need your thoughts. Isaiah 55 your thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. My ways are so much higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I think I can handle this. So God, look, and God could have handled this, what? Any number of ways. There's a, there's a, a million ways that God could have done this, but God says, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to do something here, and I'm going to, I'm going to, it'll not only uh, be the salvation of Mordecai, but further yet, it's going to start the ball rolling to save my people. And what I do is going to be so me. 
God. God said, it's going to be so like God that the Jews will celebrate it forever. And as I mentioned early on, the Jews celebrate today, once a year, the Feast of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. That is in memory, that is a celebration of when God delivered the Jewish people in the book of Esther. They still celebrate it. God says, I'm going to do something that only a God could do. And since there's one God, only I can do. And that's going, and that is designed to draw us to him. For us to look at our plans, for us to look at our, our, our designs, for us to look at our problems and the solutions that we come up with. God says, you need to forget all of that. You need to come to me because I can do things in such a way that our far and away superior and greater and more thorough than anything that you could come up with. And that's the story of Esther chapter 6. Now, but the point that I want to leave with us today is this. Well, let me back up. Ephesians 3.20. Let me give you a couple verses here. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's our God. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's our God. God says, you know, your ideas uh, 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 in, in light of my, what I can do and, what, and, and my ability, uh, your ideas are worse than what a kindergartner would come up with. You can't even begin to fathom the level that I operate on God not only knows everything that will happen, God also knows and has planned for uh, everything that will happen and everything that could happen if he decided to do that or that or this or that or this or any number of a thousand ways. God knows the end result of anyone, every one of them, and he has chosen the perfect one for you and me in our lives and in, in, in dealing with our tough times and dealing with our worries A person made the statement, precisely because of the greatness of God, we don't have to be great at all. Just in awe. Precisely because of the greatness of God, we don't have to be great at all. God does not need you to be great. God needs you to be in awe of Him and allow Him to be great in your life, through your life. It's what I like to call giving God this stage. When I pray, look this morning and, and this week and this morning, my prayer in my office is, I can't do this. But you can. I don't even ask, look, I've gotten out of the, I've, I've gotten out of the point of asking God help me. I don't want his help. I just want him to do it. And I want to stand back in awe and watch him do it through me. Does that make sense? The truth, there's one truth though, and I'm going to change gears a little bit here. There's one truth that I want to leave with you today, that God blesses and uses those that least expect it. We've already talked about what God did in this chapter and had a great time talking about it. But understand this, God used Mordecai in, in Esther chapter 2 to save the king's life. And Mordecai was not rewarded for that. God said because four chapters later, I'm going to reward him and I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to reward him and he's going to be honored for what he did for the king that day. And I'm also going to, uh, I'm going to take Haman out of the equation. Look back at chapter 2, Esther chapter 2, and I'll start reading it, but turn if you would back with me and follow, keep, catch up to me when you get there. In those days while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wroth, they were angry, and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. 
And a thing was known to Mordecai, who told unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. There's what happens in chapter 2. Short time before this, he was never rewarded, and God says, now that's of me. I will, I will see Mordecai rewarded in due time, in due season. And that's where we get lost. We do things in this life, and we, and we, we have expectations. We have anticipation of being rewarded, and, and of God reward. I did the right thing. God, uh, we well, have an enemy, enemy over there throwing, launching grenades at me, and I'm praying for him. When are you going to, uh, uh, when are you going to reward me for that? And God says, in due season, in due time, be patient. Well, God, but, you know, uh, I, I, I had this, you know, great windfall of, uh, of, 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 of money that came into my life. You know, somebody passed on, went to heaven and left me a lot of money. And, and God, and I gave, hey, I didn't give just 10%. I gave 10 and a half percent to the to your work. When are you going to bless me? God, I, 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 I saw this person like the Good Samaritan broken down on the side of the road, and, and I stopped, and, and I helped them, and, and I, I, called, I called a record, record for them. They didn't have any money, and, and I paid the record, the record guy to, to tow their car, and, and I helped them. And God, what about me? I don't see myself being rewarded for the good that I'm doing down here. If we're not careful, we make, the, the, we, we make a, a huge error and expecting to be blessed and to be used when God says, your time is coming, but not right now. I don't know that Mordecai ever said, I saved the king's life. He never did anything for me. I don't think he did. I think Mordecai saved the king's life. You know why? Because it was the right thing to do. And God says, and buddy... You're going to be rewarded, just not yet. Just not yet. Look, in verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, uh, I'm going to read these for you. Tell me if this reminds you of anything described in the New Testament. Uh, on that night, uh, could not the king sleep, and he, he commanded uh, to bring the book of records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king, and it was found written that Mordecai had told of these two guys, two of the king's chamberlains, of the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus, and the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's service, the minister unto him, There is nothing done for him. I'm going to tell you something. When I read that, uh, Several weeks ago, the thought hit me, that sounds suspiciously like the judgment seat of Christ. One day, we will all appear before Jesus Christ, the King. And the books will be opened. And all the deeds that we have done on this earth will be reviewed. And we will be rewarded for the things done on this earth at that time. That's what you call, remember we say, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. That's what you call a little nugget of truth in the Old Testament that nobody, when they wrote it, nobody in the Old Testament could even understand that that was a, that was a picture of something that would happen one day. Just as the king had the record books open, the history books, and found out that Mordecai did something, he says, I'm going to reward that guy. That's exactly what's going to happen with every one of us one day. When we stand before Jesus, the books will be opened. We'll stand before the king, and the king is going to say, Okay, let's take a look at what you've done with your life. And then we'll be rewarded or suffer loss of reward at that time. God is... I don't have the adjective. Unbelievable. Incredible. Well, we know I'm omnipotent, omniscient, I'm not present. He is everything plus a million times more. And in knowing this, we serve Him, but we, 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 uh, we make the mistake of 
expecting the expectation, the anticipation. And the truth I want to leave with you t this morning is through all of this is we see what Mordecai did for the king with nothing being done for him. Because God said, your time is coming, but not right yet. I've got bigger plans for you. If you're in here this morning and you feel like God doesn't answer your prayers, keep praying. If you're in here this morning and you say, I do good things, but I don't ever seem to be rewarded by them, keep doing good. Keep being faithful. That's all Mordecai did. And Mordecai was rewarded greatly at this time. Try not to expect, try not to twist God's arm behind him and say, look, I've been serving you. You know, when are you coming through for me? God says, okay, number one, let go of my arm. <laughs> number two, in due season. He said, I got bigger plans for you. And if I reward you now, it's going to totally, it, it totally wipes off the, wipe, wipe, you know, wipes my plan out to what I would do later through you. God blesses and uses those at least expect it. Just do right because it's right to do right. And you will be rewarded. Sometimes here and every time there. Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And it does. When we, and that hope, you, you, could, you could easily say that that's expectation. That's anticipation. We do things and then we go, and we're waiting to see what God's going to do for us. That makes the heart sick. One person said of that verse, the delay of that which a man eagerly desires and expects is such an affliction that it, that it differs little from a lingering disease. We, we, we start to expect God. When's my time? When's my reward? When are you going to bless me? When are you going to use me? And God says, be patient. Just be patient. Be a Mordecai. Do right because it's right to do right. And I will take care of you. You will be rewarded, sometimes here and every time in His presence one day. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2 speaks of this. It talks about do not, don't do your alms before men. In other words, don't do good things for people and go around telling everybody about it. Because when you do that, you got your reward right then. And, and God says, well, you got your reward because you made big of it, so you got you whatever a praise and applause of man you got, there's your reward. And you, won't, you don't get the reward that God has planned for you. Let's stop expecting God to jump when we say jump and to uh, 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 reward us when we do right. I want to see it right now. If I don't see the, the gain, if I can't see it right now, then I'm not even going to do the good thing. No, do the good thing. Do the right thing. You'll never regret it. And God, in due season. And I keep using those, that verse there. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. God doesn't do anything outside of His timing. Be patient. God will reward you. God will answer your prayer. As long as your prayers are in a, a, according to His will, God is faithful. And He expects for us to be faithful also. God blesses those that least expect it. Remember that. You see it in Mordecai. Mordecai did a great thing, and nothing was done for him. Well, he didn't go off and say, well, forget all of that. He just went on living his life, doing his job. And God rewarded him later, 
far above anything he could have imagined, I'm sure. And also, on that very act, that was the hinge, if you will, upon which uh, everything uh, turned in the delivery, deliverance of the Jews. Don't, don't hold a gun to God's head and say, I'll do this if you'll do this, and I mean now. Just don't do that. Be patient. Do right, because it's the right thing to do right. And God rewards in due season those that least expect it, that those that say, I'm going to live a holy life. Be ye holy. God's be holy, for I'm holy. Oh, that's me. I'm going to make mistakes, and God knows that. We're going to confess our sins and move on. In the work of Christ. God blesses those that least expect it. Let's pray. If you're here this morning and you're without Christ, I'd like to pray for you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure that one day that you were, you, that whenever God, whenever that last day, whenever that last breath uh, escapes uh, your mouth, if you're not sure that you would be in the presence of God, then you have questions, and those need to be, those need to be dealt with. You, you need to know. You need to know. If you're here, you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior. You never put your faith in Him. If you're here and you say, Pastor, pray for me. I don't ever remember receiving Jesus as my Savior. I'd like for you to pray for me. Would you, would you lift your hand, please? Anybody like that in our service today? Okay, if you're here today and you know you're saved, which by that testimony should be everybody, let's yield our will to Him. Let's yield our plans to Him. Let's yield our solutions. Let's yield our designs to Him. And let's just do right. As we have opportunity, let's do right. Let's be faithful. Let's live holy. Let's live consecrated lives to Jesus Christ. Not expecting... Not expecting, not anticipating the reward, but out of a love for Jesus Christ. Knowing that one day, in due time, in due season, we will be rewarded according to God's plan.